Uh, let's kind of like get into it and we'll let people join as they join. We are recording this, which is always great. So we can share that with those that couldn't make it and things come up or whatever. Um, see if J James and Shane are supposed to be on. Don't let them know we're starting to fix. Okay. I don't know what happened there. I was just on Zoom with them <laughs> 20 minutes ago. Um, so Andrew, um, I kind of already told this girl. Oh, here she comes. She's here coming. Um, I met Andrew at another event. I went down to, I don't know if you guys know Sean Finnegan down at Tax High, but he invited me to lunch. And it turns out that he was already having lunch with a group at his office and he just kind of pulled me into the conference room. And it was kind of cool because I went in there and I didn't even know why I was there, what I was doing. I thought we were meeting at his office to go to lunch. So anyway, long story short, uh, that's why I made the Chick-fil-A reference earlier is that, you know, he invited me at lunchtime. They passed me out sandwiches or whatever. Anyway, when that was over, I went into Sean's office and Andrew followed me because of his background. And he came in and said, hey, you said real estate. Radar went off, right? I, I connect with people in real estate for a variety of reasons. And we had a short little chat, but then we connected later and we got on Zoom and got to know a little bit more about what Andrew does. He's written a book. He does some coaching. Um, he's got a, has an interesting story, which I'm sure he'll kind of go into a little bit of his background and how he got where he is and why he's sharing what he's sharing. But uh, that's how all this happened. And that's why he's uh, not in person as he actually is up in, is that Idaho Falls, Andrew? Um, further west, Boise. Boise. Okay. Boise. Yeah. Um, the other uh, guy I met at that event, uh, Josh, Josh Trapp is in Idaho Falls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So welcome James and Shana. We're just getting started. I got Lynn. That's my wife, Lynn, Andrew, that's on the phone. Um, she's actually just downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just turn it over to you, Andrew, finish introducing yourself however you'd like, and let's kind of rip into it. And, um, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Absolutely. It is an honor. And can you, uh, see the screen here that I'm sharing? Yes. It's loading right now. Okay. Oh, you've got EXP front and center. March. EXP. Yep. Let's just so I just, I want to give gratitude, Jeff. Thanks for uh, letting me mosey into your private lunch with Sean. Uh, it's been an honor to get to know you. And I'm so grateful for Ashley for just like what you guys are doing. Um, uh, the what, what I've learned about you from our conversation so far and the, the brief interactions with Ashley is that your hearts are gold. So I haven't met your mom yet, Ashley, but you have at least one half a gold heart. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm sure. I'm sure your mom is just as good, if not better. She's the than better you. half by far, Andrew. So just, I want to give uh, lots of gratitude to you guys for setting this up, making it easy, and it's it's fun. It's fun to be with good people. Um, I love realtors, and I know that's a weird thing to say, uh, but when you think of like the most important jobs in the world, uh, humans need three things. They need food, they need clothing, and they need shelter. And realtors are in charge of making sure people have homes. And so unless you want to get into the like farming industry or you want to work in Victoria's Secret or something like that, like clothing, then you really do have like one of the top three most important jobs, I think, in the entire world. Um, not only that, but you, you guys are boots on the ground for our communities, whether it's a death or a divorce, uh, births, breakups, promotions, bankruptcies, you're undercover like marriage and family and career counselors. And it's funny because people have no idea what you actually do unless you're in it. And I, I love realtors as well because you're humble, you're coachable, you're willing to try new things and you're fearless and there's no limit to your growth personally and professionally, but you're not just a realtor, right? That's just a hat you wear. Um, real estate agents get a bad rap because uh, you're very public figures. We make ourselves very public and you're also human. So I don't just love you because you're a realtor. I love you because you're, you're human. And I love working uh, with humans. You and <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't do a lot of veterinary work. Jeff, I, I love your face. Will you turn me back so I can see the other ladies that are in that room with you? Oh, we're the mystery people in the corner. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There we go. Bronnie, I want to see you. Perfect. Oh, look at you. You must have written my name down because no one ever remembered my name. Good job. <laughs> 
Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I remember your name later. Um, <laughs> and tips and tricks, because I already forgot what this cute lady is. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's totally, totally okay. You're normal. You're like everybody else, Brondi. Right. So uh, the agents and, and the humans that get what I'm about to share with you guys today, they don't just double and triple and quadruple. And over years, I have clients that have 10x to their income, but they also are able to reconnect with purpose, with passion, to that that fulfillment, that that thing inside that they desire most in their life. So it's an honor to be with you. I honor you as a realtor and as a human. So now you probably want to know who I am and why you should listen to me. So <laughs> um, my name is Andrew L. Anderson. I always give the L because it's my mom's maiden name, which is Lee. And so I give honor to my mom when I share my name. I love her. I am an international best-selling author. I'm a speaker, coach, as well as Jeff said, um, I did launch this book this last year, which I'm very proud of. It's called Strength of the Oak, Strength of the Willow, How to Find Courage and Compassion in a Turbulent World. Um, but I'm also a human like you. And there are things that are more important to me than what I do when I'm away from the office. Uh, I am a husband, first and foremost. That's my beautiful wife, Shari. I am also a new father. We had a baby last year and his name is Tanner. And yes, he is the fattest baby you'll ever see. And I, <laughs> love I love him. I love him. Now, um, just so I know, how many of you have had children or have held a child at some point in your life? Okay, like you've held a babe. Okay, great. So we all know what this is like. Um, when my wife and I go out in public and we have Tanner with us, people say two things. They say, number one, they're like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. And they want to like grab his cheeks. And then the second thing they say is, is this your first? And we look at each other and my wife rolls her eyes because she knows I'm about to say something corny. And I say, no, this isn't our first. This is our seventh. And <laughs> right, by the way, Kathy Ray, I wish I could have screenshotted your face just then. <laughs> that was classic. Like, what the... Right. <laughs> at this point, when I tell people this is our seventh child, they, they look at my wife because she looks like she could be my child. Right? I mean, she looks like she's a teenage girl like the rest of them. <laughs> they, they look at her and they look at me and they're trying to figure this out. And they say, how in the world do you two have seven children? How many twins are in that? None? There, are, there are zero sets of twins, Kathy. <laughs> so they ask, how do you have seven children? And then my wife's like putting her head down because she knows I'm about to make what we call a Dave Anderson joke, which is my dad, which he just has no shame and he's the greatest salesman in the world and people love him. And I tell them, I, I say, do you really, do you really want to know the answer to the question how it is that we have seven children? <laughs> um, and, and, and they they laugh and then I say, it, I, we cheated. The, the real answer is we cheated because I don't have seven children with one wife. I have seven children with two wives. And I pause like that so that you can all politically correctly not judge me. But remember, <laughs> I live in Idaho. You guys live in Utah. So I've never been married to either of them at the same time. All right. <laughs> in Utah, they would be saying, where's the other one? Yes, exactly. So you all, you appropriately paused. You didn't <laughs> gasp like Kathy Ray did when I told her I had seven kids and you waited to suspend judgment. And so, yes, I have three daughters from my first marriage. Kella is 16, Avery and Taylin. And when I met my wife eight and a half years ago, she brought Tacy and Brody into my life and she was 26 and we had five kids. And so we wow. sold or got rid of all of our baby stuff. Because twenty six. I thought you were saying you sold your kids. <laughs> What's that? Oh no, no, yeah, we didn't sell or get rid of any of our kids. <laughs> Human trafficking is almost as bad as um, <laughs> multiple uh, wives. So I, I don't participate in either of those. Um, so we people kept talking to us about their experiences blending families, and, and they said you really should consider. You really should consider having another, so it can bring the families together. So we had Jacob. Jacob's now six years old. And then people would come to us and say, I'm that kid. And I always felt different from everyone else. Have you ever considered having another? 
So we now have Tanner. That's how we have seven kids. That's the story. Oh so you're very susceptible to uh, suggestions by others. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Jeff, there's a lot of other things that go into this. And we'll <laughs> talk about that later. I'm very susceptible, yes. Um, Ashley, this is why I would like to talk to you because having four daughters, I'm just, you know, I'm mesmerized that you actually want to spend more time with and work with your father. So I, I got to figure out how you did this. You okay. <laughs> now, your perspective on how I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. How did he manipulate you into working with him? Um, so he he paid for you to get a great education, to get a job that you hated. So I just have to like my, make my girls go through something they hate, so then they'll realize working with me would be a delight. Yep, there you go. <laughs> hey, let's be clear. I didn't pay for shit. She had a full ride scholarship. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, this one is on track to graduate with an associate's, and she's going to be a valedictorian. All this stuff. So I, awesome. I'm I'm never going to pay for any of my kids' schooling. Um, so yes, I'm an author, speaker, coach. I'm a husband, father. Remember, husband to one. Uh, and <laughs> when you have seven kids that are that have a sales coach dad, they become incredible salespeople. And now we have a dog because if seven <laughs> kids isn't enough, let's throw a dog into the picture. Um, they, the, the joke is that if you have um, two or three kids and you have another people say, what's that like? And you say, well, it's like, you know, you're, you're drowning in a swimming pool and then somebody throws you a baby. Well, if you're drowning in a swimming pool with seven kids and someone throws you a dog, uh, that's that's what it's like. It's just, it's complete chaos, but it's so fun. And there's so much love in our home. And that dog gives our children unconditional love in a way that we just can't. So we keep him. His name is Joey. So yes, I am a dog dad. I am the master. I don't want to be, but I just, I am. Uh, I'm also a friend. I love doing all things outdoors, skiing. I was mountain biking this morning. I'm going to go hiking tomorrow. I just, I love being outside. It's where I feel um, the most centered and grounded. And lastly, and it's the last uh, hat that I say that I wear, 10 years ago, like you, I got my real estate license. And that's me uh, before my wife made me over and helped me become the man that I am today. <laughs> but I love that shot because it's, it looks like I'm getting my Eagle Scout award or something. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's my story. But 10 years ago, it wasn't as happy. In fact, I found myself homeless. And would it be okay if I share with you my story of homelessness for a moment? I had been married. Thank you for giving me permission, Jeff. Everyone else is like, yeah, of course. It's a rhetorical question. Um, I I'd, I'd been married for seven years and I had been teaching for six and I loved it. And I was at the top of my game. I was finishing a master's degree at Weber State in education. And we just found out we were going to get transferred back and I was going to be able to teach here in the Boise area. Um, we were leaving Fremont High School and I was so excited to bring my master's degree, my teaching experience, my soon to be third daughter and wife back to Boise. And we moved back to Boise. I got my master's and we had baby girl number three, Taylin, all within the same month. At the end of that month, my wife told me that she didn't want to be married anymore. And I found myself not only losing my marriage, but losing those daily interactions with my daughters that I thought I would have forever. Uh, I lost my job, and as I was living in my parents' basement, I was losing my soul. I believe that not only had I failed all of them, but that I had failed God. I wasn't suicidal in that I wanted to die or take my life, because I understood that that would have implications for those that loved me, including my daughters here, but also implications on the other side, because I'm a person of faith. I, I just didn't want to exist. Have you ever been so low that death just didn't even seem like it would be enough? I just wished I wasn't created. Like what if my parents had never had the fifth child four and a half years after the their last child? Maybe I was a mistake or maybe I just don't belong here in this world. And this was a dark night of, of the soul for me. And in this lowest of lows, I 
had a brother who at the time, well, he still is a consultant, which means they get paid to tell people what to do. He helped me decide that this would be a great time at, in my life to get a 100% commission-based job where I don't make money for seven months and pretend like I have all, all the confidence in the world. And that's how I got into real estate. <laughs> <laughs> And I would knock on doors and I would hold open houses and I'd call my sphere and I pretended like I was happy and I wasn't, I wasn't happy. And at the end of that year, I found myself literally in my CEO's office. Her name is Stacy. Good friend. I love her to this day. And I, I was crying. She, I don't think she'd ever had a 30 year old man crying in her office before I was in tears. And I said, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. And she said, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I can to help you. And the next morning she called me at 7 a.m. And she offered me a job. It was the best job interview I've ever been in because I didn't know I was interviewing for a job and I just completely spilled my guts and I was a wreck. And she said, I'm making up a job for you. And that job led to me coaching agents and helping retain them to the real estate office. And after doing that for a year, I got to make money based on the production of the agents that I coached. And then we built the number one largest real estate coaching program in the, in the country at the time. And we had 116 agents in this little office of ours. And I got a split of everything they could sell. And I never had to talk to a buyer or seller or step foot in an open house or make a call with a script again. And here's what I learned in those early years of coaching. I learned that if I could treat every adult like a teenage kid, I'd be really successful <laughs> because adults <laughs> are just teenage kids pretending like they're not. And the interesting thing was I just treated the teenage kids like adults. And so I was just like, you know, just treating everybody like they were someone that they weren't because that's kind of how we all are. We're all trying to figure out who, who we are. And I realized the more that I could pour into these teenage kids masquerading as adults, and the more we could work on them, then the more success they would have in their business. Because we all know that our business is only going to grow, right? To the extent that, that we do. And I just started pouring into them. And then they, they'd make more money and I'd make more money. And I started hiring coaches and I had an assistant. And then I started coaching nationally. And then I learned about this thing called NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, the science of success. Why is it that humans do what they do? And why don't they do the things that they should? And I began to, began to find these golden threads that weave themselves through all the people I was coaching. And I began to do things at a very high level. And they would give me the clients that they didn't know what to do with, or the ones that were getting ready to leave the, the, the coaching or leave the brokerage. And they're like, will you save them, Andrew? And I'm like, uh, I will help them, but uh, I'm not going to make any promises as to whether or not they're going to stay in the coaching program or in the brokerage. I'm just going to, I'm going to help them. And I, I did that. I did that for a long time. And then about six years ago, I said, I don't like working for other people and I want the freedom that comes for working for myself. And so for the last six years, I've just been coaching solo and I don't just help highly successful real estate agents. I also help people in all other industries, business owners, their family members, and anyone else that God puts in my path. And that's me. Now, because this is such a small, intimate group, I feel it's appropriate to do this. Um, do you have any questions? Before we continue to talk about what I've learned and how it's going to change your life, is there anything you want to know about me? Like, I'm an open book. Probably not yet for me. I mean, I'll wait. Let's see what else you got. <laughs> all right, Brandy, I like you. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Anybody else? Is there anything you want to know, like at all? Because I'm happy to share before we keep going. Great. You guys are just awesome students. You're like we're just ready to learn. Well, I think Andrew, you just shared more than most people share uh, yeah. about their personal life, and so you know, to, to then go, well, what else could there be? Yeah, um, yeah there's it, nothing else to not share. That, there's not intrigue or connection there. It's just like you, you just shared a lot, right? 
Okay, Sorry. wonderful. Um, what what helped you get out of feeling not suicidal, but feeling like you didn't want to exist anymore? Yeah, that is such a good question. Uh, three things. And I write about these in my in my book. This is not an autobiography. You don't write an autobiography when you're 36 years old. This is just a couple of stories from my life, as well as lives of my clients and others. But I share about this in my book. Um, I believe it was truly angelic help. And when I say angels, I mean my brother, like angels here, like my brother, my mom and my dad. Um, there was a moment... <laughs> Jeff, I don't know if your adult children have ever done this to you. If they have, I'm sorry. And I'm ready when it comes my way. There was a moment where I remember getting in my dad's face, right? Living in his house for free, eating his food. I remember getting in his face and screaming. I was in so much pain. I just, I just blamed everything on him. It had to have been his fault. <laughs> And my dad just stood there and he took it and he started crying and he said, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I'm so, so sorry. If I had known, I would have done things so differently. And it wasn't his fault. <laughs> just like it wasn't hundred percent my fault that I was divorced and going through hell. But he took, he took all of that blame and he just loved me. So angels, there were angels here. There were friends and family members and Stacy who hired me. She gave me a job. She told me later, she said, I saw something in you, Andrew. What, what was that, Jeff? Oh, someone was talking. It was me. I'm just changing the speaker, Andrew. You kind of broke up there a little bit and I, I wanted to be able to hear better. I was breaking up because I was trying not to cry, Jeff. You, you, literally, you literally were breaking up. No. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. Um, so it, it, it was, it was, it, there were angels. There were angels here that were, that were there to help me. And I realized that it's okay to ask for help. And I certainly believe in angels on the other side. Um, there's just so many experiences where I felt like I was being helped and I got humble and I accepted help and I began asking for help. So thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Sure. All right. Let's talk about you guys now. Uh, so that's my story of homelessness. I think everybody has a story of homelessness where they feel very exposed. And you guys do this, right? Like you guys help people lose their house and, and get new ones. And they're going through really hard things. And what I found working with over 700 agents in the last nine years is that whatever they're struggling with is never about the market. We like to say it is. It's not. It's not about the market. It's not about the economy. It's not about the election year. It's not about the pandemic. It's not about inventory. It has nothing to do with what's going on outside of themselves. It's not their database. It's not their brokerage. It's not their team. Sorry, Jeff. I know you guys are great. It's, it's none of that. It's always about what's happening inside of the agent inside of the human. There's always something there that no one talks about. And I like talking about it at the very beginning with people because if I can show you how I've been liberated from my own fears, then that gives you permission unconsciously to be liberated from yours. Now, everybody struggles with some form of what I call imposter syndrome. It's faking it and never feeling like you're actually making it. And whether that's in real estate by what you post on, on social media or how you show up in your marriage or with your family or your friends or your community or your church, whatever that may be, there's always this feeling of, I don't believe that my audio and video match the actual scripts that I've written on the inside. And this is what I call the first of the seven deadly sins that break down and burn out and eventually bankrupt whether financially or mentally, emotionally, spiritually, real estate agents. Imposter syndrome. Good news. There is a cure 
there are things that I have learned that help. And that first thing is getting yourself grounded. And I love the idea of grounding. In fact, the first chapter of my book is called Grounded. And I tell a story about getting grounded when I was a little boy and what it felt like to be grounded as a 30-year-old stereotypical son living in his parents' basement. But grounding is interesting because grounding is not just a negative connotation, but it, there's a positive connotation in that we can get ourselves rooted, connected to the earth, like actually electronically because we're electrical beings, but we've been wearing synthetic materials under our feet for the last you know 80 years. But like when we remove all the stuff that gets in the way and get ourselves grounded, we can find that purpose, that passion in what I call a life mission. And until we have that connection and that grounding and that purpose and that passion, then we're always going to feel like a fraud or an imposter. And no matter what story we tell ourselves or what affirmation that we recite or what book we read or what prayer we offer, it doesn't feel real. And that's a hard place to be. So, here's a question that is not a rhetorical question that I actually want to unpack with you guys today. Why do you think our industry, real estate, is such a breeding ground for imposter syndrome? Why is it so hard within our industry? I think some people think they have to act a certain way in order to get business. They have to be somebody different or or... or or do something or, or look like something. Yeah, yeah the expectation is... Improper expectation. Yeah, improper Where does that expectation come from? And why do we compare ourselves, Shaina, thank you. Why do we compare ourselves to that expectation? Where does that come from? Why do we do it? I feel like it's... Um, I mean, for me, um, I grew up non-LDS, non-Mormon. And when I first... Wait, what's, what's that? <laughs> Oh, non-Mormon, non-LDS. I'm kidding. It's a, kidding. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Right? I, I, know what you're I, I had to mess with you just like I did the multiple times <laughs> thing earlier. I know what you're talking about. I was just pretending like I didn't understand those terms. No, I love that. Thank you for making me do wait, wait, what? What's it like? I have a story to tell I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, it for me, like I was always the person that didn't fit in with the friends in the neighborhood, right? And growing up, I was always the person that didn't fit in. Did you and grow up in that area? Yes. Are I was they... the person that no one could hang out with because my parents smoked, my parents drank, and my, I didn't go to church. Yeah. So for me, mine was, I always had to dress a certain way because if I would go into a, a certain office, even today, if I would go into a certain office and I'm wearing this shirt, people would judge me. People would look at me differently. So I think it's a lot of and I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but it's a lot to do with some of, you know, I don't wear garments. I don't wear things. So there are certain people that choose not to work with me. And I'm like, that's fine. I have plenty of other people that know me for me and love me for me. Right. It, and it's not about wearing garments or going to church or whatever. So that's what I, that's what I think. There's a lot of um, people that are worried about being judged and being right. conscious of it. And, and Bronnie, it's such a, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's very vulnerable, right? And I want you to know that I, I speak all over the country. And guess how many times I've heard this one? <laughs> oh, really? A lot? No, never. Never. Oh, really? oh, you're like describing my childhood. It's interesting because Shane is probably laughing because when we became friends, I was like, I can wear tank tops around you and you don't care. <laughs> right. And she was like, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah. So it's, it's definitely a, a very conscious thing. For me, still, even today, like I have certain offices that I would never walk into the office wearing this ever. Yeah. So, because you've done it before. Because I've done it and I'm like, oh, and people you don't walk with. <laughs> or, yeah, those are just people I don't walk with, but I actually have a really, a really big client that I work with on a regular basis. And I still to this day, I'm like, I don't even know why she likes me, but she learned to love me for me and like, and work with me right. for me right. rather than just judging me and seeing me. But I still have enough respect and know that I won't go into her office the way I'm dressed today because it makes her uncomfortable. I'm sure. completely comfortable with wearing what I'm wearing. So it's just, that's what I think. And there's a lot of people that think that they need to be a certain somebody or please everybody. 
Right. And Shana, I invite you at any time because you're, I can feel it. You got some deep, got, got, got 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 deep wisdom. So I invite you to stop <laughs> typing and chatting and actually like share this. But I, I joke that this is, this is the first time I've ever heard this, right? It's the first time I've ever heard it. And yet I hear it differently mm. in every setting and culture. And it always comes back to the comparison and the expectations and you said you gave an adjective before the word expectations. What did you say, Jeff? Uh, false. Improper. Improper. Yeah, I remember. I remember exactly. You said improper expectations. And ironically enough, we're not going to go there today because we, we're we just going to do one thing at a time. But Shana, comparison is the second <laughs> of the seven deadly sins that break down, burn out, and bankrupt real estate agents. And by the way, whoever I'm speaking to, I just take that term. This is my secret. And I, I say healthcare providers or mortgage loan originators, or it's just humans. Like it's the seven deadly sins that break down burnout and bankrupt humans. It, it is comparison. And it's a comparison that is improper. And as you said, Shana, it's been there since childhood. And it's really interesting because when we can overcome this first thing, then the rest just fall into place. Now, this is a conversation, again, I've never had with any other group, but Brandy, because you opened it up, um, Jeff and I had a conversation in preparation for this meeting. He said, Andrew, just so you know, the way that you talk about God in your book, it, it could, and Ashley's laughing because I'm sure you guys had a conversation <laughs> I watched about the video. <laughs> You had a conversation, but you said it, it could be off-putting to some people. And I said, I appreciate that. And just as we want Brondi to be able to step into any office, being who she is, I cannot not be me. In fact, my writing coach who helped me write this book, who lives down in your valley, she's li she lives in Sandy, she would make me read and reread and write and rewrite. And she's like, Andrew, you're not being authentic. There's something missing here. I'm like, will you just tell me what it is instead of making me guess? <laughs> she's like, nope. Because she's a great coach. And she's like, I want you to figure out what it is. And as I was writing my book, I was listening to Wayne Dyer's autobiography. Love it. Oh, it's, it's, by the way, my, my favorite mentors in all of life are Wayne Dyer, Stephen Covey, Gary Keller, and Jesus. <laughs> They're my favorite. So as, I, as I'm listening to Wayne Dyer's autobiography, by the way, his books are incredible. But to hear the story behind the books... He's writing his first book at 36 and I'm writing my first book at 36. And I'm like, oh, I get to learn all the things that he learned from a lifetime. He said that he only used the word God in his first book, The Erroneous Zone, six times. And at the end of his life, it's all he ever talked about. But he would say things like higher consciousness, higher power. He would say God. He would say Jesus. He would say spirit. He would say universal intelligence. He used all these terms. And... I had to go through the other side of that, Brandy, which is being okay like with who I know that I am. And the fascinating thing, Brandy, and I'm sure you can uh, attest to this as well, the more I do that, guess who I attract? I attract gays, lesbians, people that have left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to which I belong, and I just, all of these people, and they don't care. And I had set up an expectation on the other side because you had expectations here. I had, had expectations that I needed to hide behind a mask and try to like fit in to everybody else and not be who I truly was. So I had my own challenge there because of these improper, as Jeff said, these improper expectations. And where did they come from, Shana? I invite you to unmute yourself and tell us. Where do they come from? Oh, the pressure. Um, they come. <laughs> Say it again. Experiences that we've had in our childhood. That's right. Now, Sh Sh uh, Shana, I want you to stay on here. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk with you for a little bit. Okay, Shana, did you choose to speak English? Hmm, I've never thought of that before. It's a deep question. Let me give you the answer. The answer is not consciously but you made an unconscious decision to learn English so that you could fit into this March or not merchant. What's your maiden name? 
mine? Yeah. Wood. So you could fit into this wood family, right? Which is cute. I'm thinking of these little wood figurines. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you blame your parents that they didn't teach you another language? No. And you know that you can learn any language you want now, right? Yeah. Great. So I think it's funny how I was screaming at my dad, blaming him for all the things he did or didn't do when he was really just doing the best that he could to teach me the language that he had been given by his father of life, language of life. And yet I had set an expectation that was improper of who I believed he needed to be. By the way, my dad turned 75 yesterday. I'm, I'm writing his... I'm not writing a second book because I'm writing his autobiography or his biography. I just felt like I need to do it. And my dad was raised by an alcoholic father who smoked and was physically abusive. And my mother was raised by an alcoholic father who smoked and he wasn't abusive, but like my dad, he broke that generational trend. And if that was the only thing that he had done for me, which was to raise me in a home where I wasn't getting physically beat <laughs> or dealing with a verbally off the charts, raging alcoholic father, then that would have probably been enough. But what I had missed was all of the things that he had done for me. And I was focusing on everything that I want to be as a father for my children. And when we focus on, as Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy call it, the gap instead of the gain, then we're never going to feel like we or anyone else is enough. And they will never be able to fulfill all of the improper expectations that we have of them. But it's a dangerous place to be, to be a dreamer and to see an ideal and to live in America and have an uh, the potential of freedoms and possibilities beyond belief, but to become a victim of those dreams and those possibilities, never truly appreciating everything that we've gained up to this point. I'm going to pause here, and I'd love any thoughts, questions, ahas, or concerns, because I don't pretend like I don't pretend to know everything. And I realize you guys know some things. Is there anything else that you want to ask or share at this point? So I like that you made reference to Brondi's um, example of her experience and how you hear the same thing. You twisted that, right? You heard the same thing, but in a different context everywhere you go, right. as far as that acceptance goes. Because I was thinking the same thing when I said improper expectations. As people enter this industry being shown these agents on a pedestal that are successful because they're like this and new agents must do that or how could they be successful i experienced that myself um yeah. when i got my license and went to keller williams um the coaching was universal not individual it was the same for everything. Your coaching um, was probably different. Is that's why you were successful? As you 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 maybe coach the individual to their strengths versus this is what successful agents do. So you must now conform to do that. And I didn't fit that mold, just like the other molds we're talking about. I didn't fit, and so I had no place there. And I didn't figure it out until I made my own choices. And I said, what does Jeff want to do? How does Jeff want to run his business? And how does he want to prospect um, and help people and give them value? And that's when it all changed. And so, so kind of the same thing in the real estate space as growing up as a child in a different environment where the expectations are improperly set. Um, and that fear of judgment is real because right. there's judgment. So anyway, that, that's my point. Back yeah, thank piece. you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I heard it, I've heard it said once in regards to Gary Keller. Um, it's not the model, it is a model. And I could say the same thing about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Like, yes, we believe that it is the Church of Jesus Christ, but it is also a church. Like the kingdom, I believe the kingdom of God is being built in a lot of different churches all over the planet and out of churches. Like people are doing things that are building each other. And, and building something that's great. And that's why, like, 
I will speak to brokerages and faiths and I just, it doesn't matter because not only are you a, like I said before, remember, author, speaker, coach, husband, father, human. <laughs> I don't even say realtor anymore. Human. <laughs> and that's the thing that we all have in common. We're all human. We are all human. And if we can focus on the game, how we got here and replicate this as we move up to this, then it's powerful, but it starts in getting grounded. We have to go back to our roots. We have to figure out what is our purpose. What is our, as I call it, our life mission that will pull us out of this place of imposter syndrome. Now, there, uh, there's a powerful quote that I have at the beginning of my book by Aristotle. And he says that each human being is bred with a unique set of potentials that yearn to be fulfilled as surely as the acorn yearns to become the oak within it. As a leader, as a transformational leader, Stephen Covey brought servant leadership to the forefront in the 90s and the 2000s. <clears throat> there is what's called transformational leadership now. It's like, okay, if you're not serving as a leader, you shouldn't even get the job. But how do we go from servant leadership to transformational leadership? Transformational leaders like Stacy with me crying in her office saw something that I couldn't see. And she helped me transform and become something that she knew was in there. And that's what great leaders and coaches and parents do in homes, in business places, and in communities. They see something that others can't see. Leonardo da Vinci called it sapere vedere. And as my good friend and mentor Kevin Hall teaches in his book, Aspire, sapere vedere means knowing how to see. Sapere is the Latin to see, uh, is the Latin to know, and vedere is to see, knowing how to see. And when we can see something in ourselves, we can see it in others. Carl Jung taught that what we struggle with in others is usually teaching us something about ourselves. And once we can let go of that within ourselves, then it doesn't bother us in others, which is why I attract all these people that are of all different backgrounds. Because it doesn't bother me. That I'm okay with me. Now, as we identify what it is inside of us that yearns to be fulfilled, there are some very simple questions that we can ask to get ourselves grounded in this life mission. And I'd like to ask for a very brave, vulnerable, courageous volunteer who will go through out loud these five questions with me. And I promise at the end, we will have a beautifully crafted life mission statement for you. Who's it going to be? That'd be me. Yes. <laughs> Like, yes. <laughs> it can be. I, I, I really love the presentation so far. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Will you um, spell your name for Brondi so that she'll never forget it? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. Um, S A V A N N A H. Oh, great. Okay. So, what's, what's her name, Brondi? Savannah. And how does she spell it? Uh, S A V A N N A H. Great. Okay. <laughs> but does anybody know? Do you know how to spell my name? No, that is how it's spelled. Wait, 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 wait! Don't tell us. Okay. Am I you, you, you were surprised, <laughs> Brandy. You were surprised that I knew you, that I remembered your name. Yes. And people often say this to me, like, "How do you remember names so well?" I said, well, when you have 180 kids every semester that are coming through the doors of your classroom, and then there's 700 others that are coming through the doors, like you just become really good at it. But what I do is what Miss Cruz taught me in first grade. This is how I learned to spell. She would write it on the board. She would say it. She would then have us close our eyes and see her writing it on the board. We would say it. We would open our eyes. We would write it. We would say it. She was the best teacher ever. We went to her uh, retirement party. And she taught all five of the Anderson kids first grade. Mrs. Cruz taught me how to win friends and influence people before Dale Carnegie ever taught me. So what I do is I don't know how to spell your name, but I make it up. And I was literally watching this episode of The Office with Michael Scott last night and my wife. And he's in an office giving people names. And he's like, Baldy, Black Chick. And then he's going through. And that's how he remembered people's names. Now, I don't do that. But I just took Brawny. I threw a D in it. And you are now... Brandy to me. So if that's how you spell it or not, it doesn't matter. That's how I know your name. Okay, that works. How do you spell it? Yes, yeah, B-R-A-U-N-D-I-E. Okay, see, I will forever spell your name wrong, but I will say it to you and you'll never know. 
it. Okay, Brondi, Savannah, Savannah, Brondi. Glad that we could make the introduction. Here. <laughs> Thank All right, you. Savannah, here we go. We're going to do this really quickly. And what I'm going to invite you to do, Savannah, is not to write these questions down. Everyone else may write them down or they may just screenshot my screen. I recommend screenshotting my screen, but that's up to you. What I would like to do is I'd like to pose the question. Everybody else, except for Savannah, is going to write down their answer. We're going to take about 30 seconds is all because we don't need more than that. Your unconscious mind already knows the answer to these questions. So the first question, Savannah, that I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about and then answer while everyone else writes their answer down is this. Savannah, who were you meant to serve? Everybody take 30 seconds, write down your answer. And Savannah, you just think about it. No writing for you. How specific does it need to be? I'll help you with that. Okay. You just let your mind go. Whatever you're thinking is right, write it down, hold on to it. Okay, Savannah, what you got? Others. <laughs> Others. Okay. Wonderful. Now, next question. Everyone else, 30 seconds, write down your answer, and we're going to have Savannah answer it verbally. What unique gifts do you have, Savannah, to offer others that they desperately need? Savannah, you're a unicorn. What is it? What is it that you have? Um, I have experience. I have empathy. Um, I have, oh, I forgot the third one I was going to say. Um, I see one. Yeah. <laughs> One second. What was the third one? Okay. It's going to come to you, but in the meantime, it's experience and empathy. Those are unique gifts. Not that no one else has them, but it's what makes you, you. Oh, your experiences, true. your empathy. True. True. Is there another one? No. Okay. All right. Next question. Here we go. Savannah, what's so important to you about using your individual gifts to serve others? What is so important to you about that? 15 seconds. Savannah, what's so important to you about using your experience and empathy to serve others? It will change their lives. It will make an impact on their lives. Which word do you like better? Change or impact? Impact. And what does this do for you? When you're able to impact others' lives through your experience and empathy, what, what does that do for you? Let me answer right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it allows what I've gone through to have purpose and meaning. Which word do you like better, purpose or meaning? Purpose. Thank you. So, Savannah, why are you here? Now, because I'm an author and I get to string words together, I'm going to do it for you. My mission in life is to take all of the experience and empathy that I've been through to impact others' lives. This gives my life purpose. Now, this is recorded. I don't have that written down, but Jeff is, and when I say Jeff, I mean Ashley is going to share this with you later, and you can go back and you can take that. Thank you. And you can put it in your own words, because I took your words and made them my words and then gave them back to you, but then you can <laughs> take it. And that's what that's what we do. You can take that. Thank now, you. I invite anybody that wants to take a picture of this or screenshot it to do so now. Ashley, if you ask me, I'll also share these slides with you happily. Um, but those are five simple questions. And as my ninth grade art teacher, Mr. Goodwin said, keep it simple, stupid. K-I-S-S. -S. 
We don't have to overcomplicate this. Your life mission doesn't have to be like, it's just simple. Because Ashley, when I said that, or Ashley, I'm sorry, um, Savannah, when I said that, what did you feel? Empowered. Empowered. Validated. That's when, say that again. <laughs> Empowered and validated. And those are values of yours. And in coaching, I help people identify values in different areas of their life. And when we are living in alignment with our life mission, our values show up. And the degree to which we can understand our life mission and our values is the degree to which we can be grounded and we can appreciate where we've come, this gain, and not have to get so concerned and comparing to this gap of improper expectation. Jeff, I'm going to use that a lot now. I appreciate you helping me make my presentations better. So my challenge to each of you is to take those questions before you go to bed tonight. If you don't do it before you go to bed tonight, you're just not going to do it. And you can give all the excuses you want. I'm not feeling well. My kids were up. We got offers, blah, blah, blah. My invitation and challenge is to take those questions, simple answers, string them together before you go to bed. And then tomorrow and throughout the week and next week or next month throughout the, like you can change it and craft it and make it what you want it. But for now, keep it simple. Not stupid. Keep it simple. Savannah. <laughs> right. awesome. Everybody. Give Savannah a round of applause. That was so awesome. Thank you for being vulnerable. Yep. Thank you for trusting this process. Oh, and Shane is giving the heart. <laughs> you remember when that wasn't a thing? Like, we <laughs> used to not do that. Like, it just, it just wasn't a thing. All right. Thoughts, questions, concerns, ahas before we move on from the life mission and wrap up. I think I'm in a really good place. I think I'm with really great people right now. You're exactly where you're supposed to be, aren't you? It feels that way. Yeah, it does. Thank you. When we are in alignment with our life mission, when we are grounded, we don't have to force anything. Remember I talked about grounding? Like I do this every day. I go outside and I go into downward dog position. I put my hands on the earth. I take my shoes off. I walk around like this business park and people think I'm a weirdo. I am. And I ground myself to the earth because I believe that Mother Earth has something for me. It's called electric energy. It's called, for me, the light of Christ. It's universal intelligence. Joe Dispenza, I don't care what you call it, but I want to be connected to that. I want to be grounded, not only in my life mission, but physically. I want to be grounded to the earth every single day. If you want to watch a fabulous documentary, watch the documentary about grounding. I'll, I'll share that link with Ashley when she asks for it. All right. So I want to wrap this up. If you want to spend more time with me, I am not trying to prospect to get new clients. I actually only have two openings right now. But, but, if, but if you want to spend more time with me as a friend, a mentor, if you want to hear more about my journey or share some of yours, I always want to spend time with good people. If we end up working together, great. But if we don't, that's okay. Because I just want to be around good people. So if you'd like to spend 30 minutes with me, that's how you do it. Ashley can also introduce us via email if for whatever reason that thing doesn't work, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it does. <clears throat> now, I want you all to put your phones down because you're all trying to put all this stuff in. It's like there's, there's no race, right? You're very competitive. I get it. You're salespeople, but there's no race. So put your phones down. You can come back to that later, but you've got the link. It would be an honor to spend more time with you. Uh, as we wrap up, I want to give gratitude one more time to Jeff and Ashley. Can we give them a round of applause? Aren't they awesome humans? <laughs> So I want to give gratitude, Jeff. Your heart is gold. Ashley, your heart is half gold, but we've heard from your father that her, your mom's heart is platinum. So you are like gold platinum, which is why you're a beautiful woman. I'm sure your children are even more gorgeous. They just have that light and eminence of gold and platinum and all of that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. And it's a pleasure. I can't wait to spend some more time with you. And for Andrew. Yeah. So good. Great presentation, Andrew. Who has a comment or a question uh, for Aunt Andrew? I'm going to go out and buy his book uh, from Amazon. I was going to order the other day. I had two other books I had to order also for my 24-7 uh, coaching uh, program that I'm with Bill Pipes. But um, that was one of one. Did you, you told, I, I watched your little clip about a couple of days ago when it was you and Jeff talking and, and how Jeff was saying he's reading the book and audio 
audible and all that too. So that I'm going to do the same thing. So, Thank you. Yep. And if you want me to send you a copy that I sign again, only because this is a small group, when I speak to 150 people with all those Keller Williams agents down there, like they all get together, like I don't offer that, but if you want me to send you a signed copy, because you're like that kind of person, things are sentimental to you and you put them on your shelf like I do and they mean something. Yeah, then just send me a text right now. I'll give you my cell phone, 208. I'll, I'll make sure that everybody has your info. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, Ashley's got it then. But if you want my phone number, you want to write it down real fast. It's 208-494-4497. If you text me your address, 208-494-4497, I will send you, a, uh, send you a copy of my book. So, so Kathy, free. Ray, thank you. For free or for me buying it? No, I mean, just, <laughs> just well, no, I, I just want to be up front. I just need to know. I'm just going to be up front. It's like $6 okay. to send, and I will gladly do that for six of you. Oh, <laughs> great. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Yeah, we'll text you. Yes. And... Um, Jeff, I do have five more minutes if we need to, if anyone else has any questions or anything you want to share or ask or before we go, I'm happy to stick around. How old are all your kids? 16, 14, 13, 11, <laughs> 10, 6, and 1. Don't ask me their birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. It just takes more brain power. My daughter has a really, really good friend and they... I don't know if it's 13 or 12. I know they were shooting for 12. They have had 12. They have 12 same parents. Okay. Yes. And, uh, but I think there's might be a 13. I can't remember for sure if there was, but, but they're Catholic. So they had that many kids. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. okay. Their very oldest son, I think he's graduated from high school and everything going to college. I think he's going into the priesthood. So, cool. but yeah, thir 13. 12, 13 kids. Yeah, I'm not trying to win any competition. He's not that competitive. I think my body won't be able to have one more even. So, so that's what she said. That's great. Shana? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for this presentation. Mm -hmm. I, um, My husband and I, James, we have done an exercise like this in the last eight or nine months. And having that purpose statement really makes a big difference in, I mean, it. I don't think you can master imposter syndrome or comparison. Like it'll keep creeping up and coming in with different cycles of life, whatever it may be, but having some statement like that to fall back on and to remember who you are is so, so powerful. So I'm, I'm grateful that you did that especially for Savannah, because I love her so much. And I'm just excited for, I don't know, when everybody channels into that purpose, it, like, we can literally change the world. I so agree. So because, Shana, because you exposed the second of the seven deadly sins, I'm going to give you the third, because you said something there that I'm going to call out, because that's what coaches do. You shared a limiting belief. Did you guys hear what she shared that was a limiting belief that she has? She already knows. What was it, Shana? But I can't master those yeah. things. Yep. And that's the third. Number one is identity fraud. Number two is comparison. And the third is the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we can, because I've seen my dad do it. Dave Anderson, the greatest salesman in the world. He took the class, Spiritual Roots of Human Relations from Stephen Covey at his feet at BYU. Like my, I've watched my dad do this. He doesn't compare himself to anybody. It drives my mom crazy because she wishes he would. He is so embarrassing. <laughs> he knows who he is. And, and you will too. And here's the thing that different, and again, this is, this is the second and third and fourth and whatever presentation, but the way that we get past that fear of failure is through a very simple process that I use called mental and emotional release. It's letting go of all, all of the stuff that we've had unconsciously since childhood that makes us afraid or feel shameful or guilty or hurt or angry or sad and literally using neuroscience to change neural pathways so we can think and feel and experience life differently. So you can, you will. In fact, someday you're going to be like, Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay humble, but I think I've mastered it. <laughs> and you don't have to be a 75 year old grandma. Yeah, I've 
Like, I'm 73, so I'm close. <laughs> liar. There's no way. No way you're 73. Oh, yes, I am. Okay. That's what they say about my mom. They say, there's no way. They they think my dad is, and again, a polygamous, whatever, because my mom looks like she's 40 something. That, by the way, when people like, who mentioned my hair? Was that you, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, I said you had cool hair. Yeah. It's my mom's fault. I mean, my mom is gorgeous. My dad just is the greatest salesman in the world. So that's, that's, <laughs> all, right. that's, all, her, huh? oh, that's awesome. all right. Anything else? I got a couple more minutes. Anything else you guys want to ask or share? Well, I just want to thank yeah. you, Andrew, for your time. I think, uh, you know, the, the comments here kind of attest to the fact that having your purpose defined in your, for yourself is so important. People struggle in real estate. We talk about the market. We talk about all these things or whatever. But if you know why you're doing what you're doing and and, and that purpose behind it is to serve others and, and, and that you know that you can impact their lives by just being in their life, then you you work through all the other shit, right? It mm -hmm. becomes irrelevant. All that other stuff is like, it's just logistics, right? And you just keep plugging away. Instead, we all know people that are not instead. On the adverse side, we all know people that struggle. They talk about their struggle because they haven't figured out why they're doing what they're doing. So uh, uh, that's great, Andrew. Great, great presentation. Great share. Great thoughts to to let marinate up here a little bit more and sh and share in the future. This is an amazing presentation to share. Mm -hmm. I will be doing that for sure. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you, Ashley. Yes. Have a blessed day. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. See you, Andrew. See you guys. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Shana. Thank you, everybody. James, if you can still hear me, I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that you didn't say anything. We didn't even say the end. We didn't get anything. Bye, Kathy. Bye. Oh, oh, wait. You wanted to ask yeah. me something. Go ahead. Okay. We got some lunch here, guys. Yeah. Um, You wanted to ask me about next week. Oh, am I still there? Okay. I, yeah, you're still here. I, I, you were. I saw that you were the last one on, and you wanted to ask a question anyway. So. Oh well, if if now it's okay, that's. I mean, I don't want to take you from something else. So, um, well, um, 